613, 1320 WILS. So uh, that San Bernardino shooting may have happened a while back, but now more and more people are attending active shooter trainings. It's actually caused this reaction, and this is nationwide. Dr. G.M. Cox, a law enforcement expert at Tarleton State University and spent four years as in law enforcement himself. Uh, G.M., great to have you here. Glad to be here, Mike. Yeah, four years in law enforcement. What kind of work did you do? Uh, 40 years. 40, I was, 40 uh, years. I, yes, I missed yes, uh, 36 of them there, but go ahead. <laughs> no problem. No, I started out as a military policeman in the Air Force and uh, served uh, about two years as a deputy sheriff in Texas. And then the rest of my time, I was a chief of police in four different cities in Texas, basically all over the map. Right. So you go from law enforcement and now you're you're a professor, basically, right? I am. I, yeah. I graduated uh, with my Ph.D. in 2011 and yeah. decided to retire from law enforcement in July of last year and been an assistant professor at Tarleton. Yeah. What's more stressful, being a police officer or a professor? That's a great question. I'm beginning to believe it's a professor. I, it's just a constant churn to try yeah. to get all the, the courses done and, yeah. and students uh, addressed, so it's, it's constant. You, you don't quite have the same authority, do you, as a professor? Uh, it's a meteoric decline. I went from uh, having a chief and chief's authority to absolutely zero. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, That's so, all right. Uh, tell me, Jim, because when I think of, of the active shooter uh, situation, right. I think of the uh, the Columbine video in the uh, in the um, right. cafeteria where everyone's just running for their life. What what right. what is that really like? If you're in an active shooter situation, how do people typically mm-hmm. react? That's a great question. Uh, people typically, if they don't have a plan. If they haven't thought about what it would happen, if it happened to them, they typically freeze. They don't know what to do. They don't know where to turn. Uh, my philosophy basically is the best person to take care of you is you in these types of situations. As you've seen, these things are dynamic. They're explosive, uh, rapidly developing. So the time from uh, the active shooter on scene to an officer arriving on the scene, assuming they weren't already there, it's going to be three to five minutes minimum, so you're going to have to take care of yourself. You say, you say freeze, though. When, when there's a gunfire going off not too far mm-hmm. away from you, you're saying the instinct is not to start running? It's actually to, to somehow freeze in place? You'd be surprised. Look at Columbine, for instance. Uh, we learned a great deal in Columbine. We learned uh, about uh, well, we looked about we learned about radicalization of local individuals. Uh-huh. Uh, Kelsey uh, Seabold and Harris were the two shooters in Columbine. We learned a great deal about their behaviors, where they got right. their behaviors, and how that that went about. Okay, we learned let, great. Let, more. let me fast forward to the San Bernardino, this most re- recent shooting, yes. where they're yes. in, a, in a room, essentially a big room full of people. Uh, yes. what, what would you learn in an active shooter training to to survive something like that? That's a great point. I would talk. I would try to train everybody on situational awareness. Do you know your environment? Do you know your room? Do you know where you at? You are. So mm-hmm. if someone were to come in there and attack, what would your plan be? And you should be thinking about that when you walk in the room. And I'm not asking people to be paranoid. As a matter of fact, I think that's a bad idea. But I think you should be prepared. Look around. Mm-hmm. I call that situational awareness. Uh, so, what are you so, contributing so if, to your own danger? If you identify an exit, is the the best idea to immediately run to an exit if something starts happening? That would be my recommendation. Unless you're in an area where you can actually lock down, control entry and exit, and you have some some cover, mm-hmm. uh, remember, cover gives you some protection from the attack. Concealment only hides you. They can't see you. That doesn't mean it protects you at all. Yeah. For instance, hiding behind a sheet of paper is concealment, but is not cover. If you were to hide behind a desk that's behind the wall, behind a door, that would give you some some cover. Right. Uh, and the ability to control entry into that uh, room or that area. Hiding in general, though, is that, is that a good idea? Do active shooters tend to really open drawers and look under things? Is that what they do? I think it depends on how fast they're they're confronted by law enforcement. Uh, the, we have some evidence, as in Columbine, as we have in Sandy Hook, uh, and we saw in San Bernardino, although less so, they knew exactly what they were going to do. They had a plan, and I'm talking about these active shooters. Mm-hmm. They executed that plan. They walked into that room. They knew what they were going to do. The ones who ran or run will might get injured. There's nothing to say that you won't get injured, but many of them live. Now, mm-hmm. the, in some cases, as we saw in Columbine, those kids that hid under tables in the cafeteria, Harris and Klebold just went through and started executing them. Mm-hmm. So those kids that ran had a, in this case, 
a better chance of survival. And many of them did run, and they lived. Is, a couple is, of them ran and got shot. Is there any uh, anything about potentially confronting someone that's, uh, uh, I don't know, maybe even if they're reloading, is there any kind of strategy in trying to do that? Mm-hmm. Or is, is that, uh, right. yeah. I would say a rapid explosive attack. For instance, uh, if, if they'll go to the Department of, uh, of Homeland Security and ready.gov, there's a great program there called Run, Hide, Fight. In that order, if you can, do them. If you can't, go to the next step. For instance, your first step would be run. If you cannot run, then hide. If you cannot ride, hide, then be prepared to fight. When I say fight, use improvised weapons, improv- everything, anything. Get people, the more people you can get to resist, start hitting, uh, hurting the attacker. Mm-hmm. And, yes, that has shown. Look at the in Sandy Hook, for instance. Although we lost two great people, they resisted the shooter, saving multiple lives. Yeah, with throwing things at them, could that work? You throw things at them. Hit them with a chair. Yeah. Uh, look in your room. People should be looking in their office, their workspace. Yeah. What do you have that you could actually use to defend yourself well, with? What, 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 kind of, one last thing, though. How, 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 I mean, how, do you, how are you able to even operate when you're um, that frightened? How do people overcome that? That's, what, that's part of the pl- being prepared and have a plan, yeah. uh, having thought about it. In other words, people should be thinking about when they saw San Bernardino, what would I do if that happened in my case? Mm. How would I respond? Am I capable of responding? Uh, am I physically able to run? Am I physically able to resist? These are all questions that people should ask. But here's the thing. If you don't have a plan, if you haven't prepared, then you're going to rely on panic. Fear and panic are the worst two things you can do in an active shooter situation. Dr. G.M. Cox, professor at Tarleton State University in Fort Worth, uh, four decades, more than four decades, enforcement uh, experience in law enforcement. Uh, Dr. Cox, thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you.